uh, different types of sanctions, and the new kid on the block, restorative justice. It restorative justice. So what is probation? Right there. What is probation? A sentence entailing the conditional release of a convicted offender into the community under the supervision of the court subject to certain conditions for a specific amount of time. Probation. So what's parole? Don't they do the same thing? Supervise inmates? Who could tell me besides Craig what's the difference between probation and parole? You don't learn something. Remember this. The difference is who writes the check? Who's paying them? Probation, the county. Parole is the state. Probation is a condition of a sentence. If the person's been found guilty, this is a condition of a sentence from the, the court. Parole is after release. They've done some time, either in the county or state facility, and now they've released them to the community after doing some time. Now they're on parole. Traditionally, parole officers work for the Department of Corrections. Probation officers work for the county. Uh, could be the district attorney's office. Sometimes it could be under the sheriff's. Just depends on how that county's on. Their specific duties are very similar in how they classify offenders, uh, monitor behavior, and write reports. Okay? Probation, parole. Very similar, but still different. Community sentences. This is something done at the court in lieu of sending someone to prison. Community sentencing. These are some of the pros. Can be structured to maximize security and maintain public safety. That is really cool. Because every offender that goes before the court is different. There's no two exactly the same. They could be similar, but there's still key differences. So the conditions of release are going to vary depending on the offender, the security needs required. Uh, let's look at feature restoration and reintegration and can act as a second chance. Give somebody a second chance to prove they're not a screw up. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, restoration, making the offender victim whole again and giving them back into the community. <coughs> where most of these convicted offenders are going to end up as your neighbor one day. These types of sanctions help improve the likelihood of success for this offender to modify behavior. And that's really what we're looking for. Okay, any questions on the concepts here? <coughs> Common law practice of judicial reprieve. Allow judges to suspend punishment so that the convicted <coughs> offender could seek a pardon, gather new evidence, demonstrate they had reformed their behavior. Judicial reprieve. Reconnaissance. Enable convicted offenders to remain free if they agree to enter in debt obligation with the state. OR is primarily used to guarantee someone appearance, their appearance, at trial proceedings in lieu of bail. Okay, rather sanctions to keep them locked up. Don't want to keep somebody locked up if you don't have to. That's kind of the where we're at right now. 10, 20 years ago, we wanted to keep everybody locked up. Let's change. Main reason to change, not because the state decided, oh, let's be nice. It's expensive. We talked about that. It's very costly to keep somebody incarcerated. 
About 4 million people today are on probation. More than 2 million are placed annually. A little bit higher placement rate than they're being released. That's why our numbers keep escalating. Probation rules are a set of conditions, restrictions, mandated by the court that must be obeyed by the probationer. If you have an offender in front of you, you're the judge. This person's in for a DUI, driving under the influence. Second offense. First time was just a simple DUI, busted at a checkpoint. The instant offense, why this offender is back in the courtroom, driving under the influence again, but this time was involved in a vehicle accident with an innocent vehicle, a little van, parents, children, enjoying a Friday night dinner on their way home. When this offender ran right into a T-bone, caused minor injuries to the kids, a lot of trauma, psychological, Parents got banged up a little bit, maybe lost some work time. What are you going to do with this or, uh, offender? Are you going to consider probation for him? Or are you going to send him to jail? What do you think you would do? You're the boss, you're the judge. Send him to jail. Send him to jail. Send him to jail. Anybody not going to send this person to jail? Go ahead. I know you want to say it. Ready to come out of her seat. No. What are you going to do? Send him. I would, I would like to send him to jail, but since we know that like, whenever someone gets sent to jail, they commit a crime, or not all the time, but you, you can learn some things that are not the best. Um, I just, I, I feel like maybe probation with like the nighttime, you know what I mean? Like nighttime check ins and stuff. Okay. Um, Conditional release? Yeah, it would be better. Okay. Because, yeah. Yeah. If, in lieu of pleading guilty, the court may consider part time incarceration. Like she was alluding to. On the weekends, you've got to be in the gym. Uh, maybe six months or so. Let's see how this guy's going to be. Uh, in the evening, you check in. But you get to at least maintain your employment because this guy does work. This offender does work. He does have a family. He has obligations. So we're going to allow him to continue his employment so he can support <coughs> his family. But any free time you spend with him. What about restoration? Okay, that's up there. Are we going to make him pay for anything? Financially? Yeah. Hold him financially accountable? for the losses that that family sustained. How about instead of sending them to jail, we let this poor person go to a program for substance abuse? Think about that one. There's a lot of, remember the judge that used creative sentences? Have the girl sit in the garbage dump and all that? Think that way, that you know there's alternatives to just let someone sit in a cell and not do anything. Right? Put them to work. Make them pay for their damages. Let them get the help they need so they quit drinking. That seems to be the root of the problem is the drinking. When this person is not intoxicated, he's a productive citizen. That's what we want. Right? We just don't like this other part. So as a judge, you get to set those restrictions as a condition of probation. Now let's say this offender we did all these wonderful things for. But one day, instead of being at work during his lunch period, he hangs out with his buddies and really kind of you know. That just happened to be the day that his probation officer was going to come by and see how he was doing. Because they can do that. Check on him, see how he's doing. Probation officer, that's you. Go to his job site. Find this person who's on probation, <coughs> totally sauce. Drunk off drunk. Oh, the drunk is a stone. That was it. It's got a stone tree. But anyway, he's drunk. You're the probation officer. What are you going to do? Is it his last day? It's somewhere in the middle. 
of this term in yeah, the middle. Let's say he's done three months pretty good. Either way, we know Green Tree is a follower. Green Tree is a follower. So we probably call a sponsor or something. Mm -hmm. Rather than the AA, rather than the dog. Okay, so you're still hoping. Anybody, as a probation officer, anybody want to violate this guy? He violated the conditions that he promised and swore to under oath, promise he made with the judge that he was going to refrain from drinking, visiting drinking establishments, and all these other things. Associating with people who are consuming alcohol, that's usually another one they throw in there. He violated all of those conditions. You want to send him to jail? Yeah. I want to give him a You want to share? Yeah, you put up on him to begin with. Um, the trend, and I'm kind of hard for the swan night for you, but the trend these days is second, third, fourth chances. Continue working with this individual. Let's get them home, let them sleep it off. I don't like talking to somebody that's under the influence while they're high or drunk, whatever the case may be. They're gonna forget everything. They may say something they regret later. First, let them sleep it off. Get them when they're clear headed. Bring them into the office, then talk to them. Okay? He's not a threat. He doesn't pose a flight risk. He doesn't pose a threat to anyone for violence. Not a sex offender. So there's a lot of good things going in our favor. We're assessing the risk. <coughs> That's what probation does. But because this guy showed us that he's flawed, he can't always refrain from drinking, we're going to have to spend more time with him. We may violate them, we may not. And we're gonna talk about violating, violating parole and violating probation. We'll get to that in a little bit. Is that part of like, the discretion? Are you saying, like, you're supposed to under the law violate anything? Or no, that's just the discretion part. Good question. Absolutely a discretionary decision on the parole or probation officer. There are certain guidelines but that one, they leave it up to the officer, the supervising officer. You know him best. You know your case like best. Doesn't mean he's gonna stay there, because his case is gonna get reviewed by the court. But at least for that night, you can buy him. Okay, revocation. That means those conditions of parole are violated. We're revoking the parole or probation, and you're going to jail or prison. Uh, probation may be revoked if probationer fails to comply with rules. Disobeys reasonable requests to meet treatment obligations. Some states have a statewide probation service, but each court jurisdiction controls its local department. Other states maintain a strong statewide authority with centralized control and administration. State of California falls in the ladder when it comes to parole. They have state offices, they got local districts, they got local offices, but everything is centralized in Sacramento. Counties, usually you'll find probation office uh, in the uh, jails. They have a sheriff and they'll usually have probation there. Uh, they may be somewhere near or adjacent, but they're usually close. Okay, probation authorities have worked with social networking sites to identify and remove registered sex offenders using the service. Often as a result, sex, sex offenders are banned from any and all non-employment related internet use. Is this akin to barring individuals convicted of fraud from all telephone use because they use the telephone to commit fraud? Maybe. Is it a fair condition of probation in your opinion? Okay, we're talking about sex offenders here. And they're saying that because this person is a sex offender, they cannot use the internet or it must be supervised use. Do you think that's fair? <coughs> mm -hmm. What if the offense had nothing to do with the internet? Should we still take the internet? Now I see Paul Reed at something. It depends, right? It depends. If you take this offender's access to live contact where he can offend. You remove that. What's left? The virtual environment? 
internet. Hell yeah, I don't want to take it. Because otherwise, I'm just moving them from one area where they can violate to a different area where they're going to violate. It's even easier. But if you restrict it, you take that away, remove the temptation. So yeah, I know. And is it a fair condition of probation? Who, do, who thinks it's not? Sex offenders. Uh, probation officers. These are some of the duties that the probation officers will do. PSI reports. Intake. Diagnostics. Treatment. Risk classification. As a parole or probation officer, well, we'll stick with probation. If you go to a courtroom, criminal court, you're going to find they're pretty much set up the same. The bench is at the front of the room where the judge sits, and then the clerk. Off to either side, you'll find a seating for a jury. Then you're going to see a desk on each side of the courtroom, and usually there's a podium in the middle. The defense table is on one side, prosecution's on the other. The defense team, you're going to see the attorney, the offender, and maybe an investigator or another attorney. Probation side, excuse me, the prosecution side, you'll have the district attorney or deputy DA at that table with their files and all kinds of crap. And right next to them is a probation officer. The probation officer is responsible for that PSI report. Three seconds. We have a trial. The trial kicks in here. It concludes. Jury comes back. Find them guilty. Before sentencing, the judge is going to ask probation, how long do you need to put the PSI report together? Seven to ten days usually. Probation officers a good probation officer is very proficient in writing these types of PSI reports. If you haven't read a PSI report, you should. They're a work of art when done correctly. They take this individual's entire life story from birth to their current status. They interview witnesses, employers, friends, neighbors, they talk to doctors, and the doctors share whatever they can. A lot of times, a defendant will waive their right to privacy. I've pulled mental health files before. As long as the defendant agrees, they waive the uh, confidentiality section of it, so I can go and review these files to run my report. Not as a PSI, but as an investigator. The PSI does the same thing. They get the same waivers, so they can access confidential information, so that when it's presented to the judge, the judge has a good idea what this person's all about. That's the whole concept of the pre-sentence investigation. Intake, they only do that a couple hours uh, back at the jail. Somebody's new commitment, or they just turn themselves in. I've seen that happen a couple times. Uh, they come into the county jail. They surrender themselves. Probation officer is the one that's going to do the processing. They're going to ask the questions, find suitable housing, make sure this person's not at risk. If there's medical needs, treatment plans, whatever the heck they have to do, that's a probation officer. Uh, treatment modes, if this person is su suffering from mental health, they have to meet with a mental health professional X amount of times. Uh, and then risk. What type of security does this offender require? Remember, the county's limited as far as security goes. They have holding cells, they have dorms, they have some security housing, but not if a person is a very serious threat. In Kings County, where I was at, when they got these high risk defendants, they haven't been sentenced yet, so they're still free people, but their bail has been re refused. There is no bail because this person is that much of a, a risk. They contract with the state prison nearby. 
in our case is plumbing. So if we had an, a person that we did not want at the county level, we would take them over to corporate where they kept them on safekeeping. If you usually got an SK number, just so we can keep track of this individual. And it happens more often than you think. Probation is a very active position. And what I'm talking about here is adult probation. If anyone's interested in working with juveniles, juvenile probation, their duties are similar, but different because you're talking about a minor. Okay, so risk classification, number of assessment instruments used. Evaluation of instruments show that when they are used properly, they can be highly valid, and the neighborhood where probationers reside must be considered in the individual risk classification. The state and the county do risk assessment very similar. It's a classification score sheet. Okay. So if you're in the commitment, the probation officer is going to sit down and do an interview, ask you specific questions. Are you married? Do you serve in the military? Are you a high school graduate? Level of education? Is this your first offense? Do you have any children? Do you consume substances, illegal substances? If everything this person is responding to, they're filling out a little box, just a check box, and it's accumulating points. They both work up of a point system. At the end of this questionnaire, you total up the points. If I only got 12 points on this offender, that means they're very a low custom, low security. I put them in the door. I'm at the very bottom. The higher the points, the higher the security risk. Uh, I think it's 51 and above, you're a level four. And one through three is 50 and below. They change the cutoffs depending on housing. If we have more level one beds, then the score may go up, so we get more level one offenders. If we have level two beds, level three beds, the scores are adjusted. The 50 to 51 points for highest level security does not change. And that's always been a constant. Okay, so that's the risk classification. I want to know where I can safely house this offender. The county needs to know that, and the state when they reach the prison level. Okay, so let's look at this question. There are both objective and subjective elements to risk assessment, including the role of the community to the probationer. How much stock do you believe we could put in the prediction of someone's future dangerousness? And would you be willing to assess someone's likelihood of committing a future offense? Why, why not? Would it depend on the offense they committed? Now you're a probation officer, and you're making a recommendation to the court whether or not this person should be considered for probation. That's in that PSI report. Every trial that I've been a part of, at least it's been a couple hundred, where the probation officer makes a recommendation, I have yet to hear a judge go against it. Okay. That's how valued a good probation officer is. So the probation officer in the report writes, my opinion, this individual should not be considered for probation, rather they should receive the appropriate term. That kid is not going to go on probation. It's that simple. However, the probation report says that they recommend probation, and then they'll usually set some conditions. The judge pretty much goes right down that line. Like I've worked in some pretty good courtrooms with pretty good judges. Think about it. If the judge goes against that report, where the probation officer is saying this person should not be allowed back out in the community. And the judge says, I don't agree with you. I'm gonna put him back out in the community. And that guy reoffends. Maybe kill somebody. Wow. Thank goodness the judge does have immunity, but still, they probably won't get reelected. And it's gonna hurt them that they did that. They're good people for the most part. I can't think of one real bad judge yet. But for the most part, they're pretty decent. Bad VAs, yeah, they're so, but not the judge. 
They want to do what's best for the community for the most part. from my personal knowledge that I saw at a county courthouse. If you want to pull that out on yeah. federal, then that's fine. But when I'm referring to the judges I've worked with and I've seen, they're pretty good. Uh, I would say maybe half of them were former DA. The other half were defense attorneys. Yeah. I was lucky. And like I said, I worked in a good county. That's not always the case. So that's probation. Assessing risk. Making sure... You're protecting the community while affording due process and give this guy, person, as much leeway as you can. Okay? It's dangerous sometimes. Uh, the concept, U.S. Supreme Court rule, probationers have a unique status and they are entitled to fewer constitutional protections than other citizens. There's three cases here I only got the cases listed, but I started researching them a little bit. I thought, no, let's put the questions up there that are associated with each case. Murphy, does the Fifth Amendment require suppression of probationers' incriminating admission where the probationer is required to meet with his probation officer and to be truthful, and the probation officer has reason to believe the probationer's answers to her questions as a female at the time are likely to be incriminating? What happened? This person was sentenced to probation. Part of the conditions were to meet in group and discuss, show remorse for your actions. This offender was a sex offender. They were granted uh, probation with certain conditions. One was to meet in this group. In one meeting, this offender makes a comment that they're sorry for raping and murdering this person. The supervisor in that meeting goes, murder? You're here as a sex offender. Murder was never part of the condition. So that person calls the probation office. Says, listen, this guy just made, or gal, just made this statement that they are remorseful for rape and murder. So now the probation office gets involved. Pulls this person in, interviews them. And the person states again, well, I thought that was confidential. That's why I opened up. That's why I said I did what I did. Never denied doing it. So this person now, probation office, writes up the report, sends it to the district attorney. District attorney files new charges for murder. Brings them to court, found guilty. He threw the book at him. This individual filed the appeal. The appeal goes to the state Supreme Court. They overturned it. They said, no, that comment was confidential, not an admission of guilt. When the other person did the interview, they did not admonish them of their rights. So they failed to properly inform this person of their due process rights. Therefore, anything they said is a violation of their due process. They reversed it. Okay. Gets kicked up to SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States. They reviewed the case. They reversed the lower court. Said no. Because this person was not being considered for a crime. It was just an interview. So whatever they said, they were not being detained. They were free to leave. They did so knowingly, voluntarily, and intelligently. It was a split, I think, 5-4. So they just barely passed for it reversed. So because that happened, now it's written in precedence that anyone <clears throat> in these type of settings, if they make an admission to a crime, it can be used against them. Okay, that was Murphy. Yeah. In Griffin, does a warrantless search of a prisoner's residence violate the Fourth Amendment? It was conducted on reasonable grounds. Part of the conditions of parole or probation is you do weigh your right to search and seizure. 
not only in your home, but anywhere where you're present, including your person. So if I accept those conditions, and then I go and visit somebody, and the probation officer just happened to have seen me go to this house, comes into the house, they can knock, let themselves in, because this defendant is there. They have free reign to pull this person out of the house, conduct a pat down search. They can search the residence where this person was at within arm's length only. They can't search the entire house, only where this individual is, this person of interest. That's what Wisconsin gave us, the right to search and seizure. The Supreme Court said it was okay. Then in night, does a search pursuant to a common California probation condition, supported by reasonable suspicion, satisfy the Fourth Amendment? <coughs> yes. That was an 18 minute seizure. If I have probable cause, that's the highest level. But if I have reasonable suspicion, like I kind of think this is what's going on, I can do what I need to do as far as searching. Where if you're not a probationer, if you're not on parole, I can't do any of this without probable cause. So anyone on probation or parole has a lower degree of expectation towards privacy when it comes to search and seizure. Does that make sense? Good, no questions. Uh, because police, or because placing a person on probation implies that probation will continue unless the probationer admits or commits a major violation, the defendant has been given certain procedural process rights at this stage. Okay, because they're on probation or parole, they're not really free. Okay, they're, they're on a lanyard, they're on a chain. But just because they're on that chain doesn't mean they forfeit all their rights. That's what these cases are talking about. Uh, Scarpelli, Brewer, and probably even Ray are the three more famous ones. Uh, the Morrissey, Morrissey versus Brewer. That one I'm very familiar with. During parole revocation hearing. Prior to uh, Morrissey, they didn't have to do a hearing. They would just find this probationer, violate them on the spot, send them back to jail or prison without a hearing. They said, well, that's kind of a violation of rights. That was in Morrissey. And the court agreed and says, yeah. You do have to have a hearing. Inform this person why they're being violated and what the terms of that violation are. Goes a step further. Now this person wants to be represented. They want an attorney. The court said no. Okay, because this is an administrative process. You can hire an attorney, you can consult with one, but one does not need to be present, and we will not provide you an attorney. Very, very important. That's for the revocation here. Clear? Clear as mud, right? Okay, concept. National research suggests 65% of probationers successfully complete their probationary sentence. 30% are arrested, violate probationary rules, or abscond. They're on the run. And most revocations occur for technical violations during the first three months of probation. There's some facts of what happens when someone is on probation. 65% success rate. That's pretty damn good. Pretty good. 30% though, not so good. Some will reoffend, meaning they get a new term, new case, or they just simply are violated on the conditions of the probation. Used to be a good buddy of mine, uh, we worked together for a while. He ended up going out for a parole. Uh, he retired as a parole officer. When he started, if he had a hunch that this individual was doing something inappropriate, he could go, observe, investigate, search, continue, and never hit. All on his own. Violate his parole right there on the spot. Bring him back into the office. Finish his processing. Take him to the county jail or stick to a prison. 
all as a probation officer, just one person had all that authority, that changed. I can't do that anymore because it was being abused. And not because it didn't work, but it was being abused. So now they had to put a check and balance. The state now regulates who and why an individual can be violated on parole or probation. And it's a lot harder to get somebody locked up again. Okay? The concept, even the most serious criminals who receive probation are less likely to recidivate than those who are sent to prison for committing similar crimes. Interesting. Young males who are unemployed or who have a very low income, a prior criminal record, or a history of instability are most likely to be rearrested. That second bullet, isn't that just obvious? Right? You're setting somebody up to fail if you're paroling or releasing them to these types of conditions. The one I don't like is when somebody's released, probation or parole, they're sent right back to the convicting county. Right back where they got in trouble. Right back where all those friends and family are that got them in trouble. What are the chances this person is going to be successful? Not very good, right? And in order to get placed in a different area, they have to go through the district attorney's offices and both have to agree to accept this person into their county. It's not easy, but it does happen. Uh, current initiatives that may shape the future of probation. Making probationers pay. Enhanced community engagement. Area needs. Specialized probation. Privatization is a big one. And swift and sure punishment. Future of probation. Private. I never thought I'd see a private prison. And they do work. As a private prison, they still have to have CDC presence. They have a lieutenant that oversees the whole thing, the operation, and hears uh, administrative violations. CDC will get them. They have a sergeant who supervises their staff and provides training. And they usually have a couple of officers for transport. But the rest of the staff are free staff, or what you would consider like a security guard, makes minimum wage, and these are the ones they put out on the tier to supervise the inmates. And that's how they save money and make money. And they can bring lower trained staff into their facility. Just a miracle they don't have more problems than they do. Private. I'd like to see a private works when it comes to probation. Haven't seen it yet. Other alternatives. Intermediate sanctions. Include programs that are usually administered by the probation department. Group of punishments falling between probation and prison. Anything but total incarceration. House arrest. Those ankle bracelets, uh, intensive supervision. When you're on probation or parole, there's levels of supervision from minimal to the highest level. Uh, minimal, just a phone call or two a week, a month, whatever they, they feel is appropriate. Uh, probation officer might come by once a month, once a week, just to check on you. Most often, you're required to go into the office to check in. Very low level of supervision. Uh, serve as alternatives to art incarceration. For me, anything better than being locked up because of the cost. Now, if you have a serious violator, someone who is a career criminal, gang enhancements, violence, a propensity for violence, uh, hurt children, or a sex offender, they're going straight to prison. I'm not putting them in a kind of probation program. But that's just me. Okay, intermediate sanctions. What types of crimes would you advocate 
for intermediate sanctions? Does it depend on whether it is a first or second offense? And do you think these types of sanctions are effective? Okay, you're the judge again. You have an offender. Never been in trouble in their life. 25 year old Hispanic male. Not married, but lives with a female and they have two children today. Are they the police? No. Girlfriend, boyfriend, you don't have kids in the Mama, daddy, baby, daddy type of thing. Oh, okay. Right? Well, you don't, you're not married, right? So they share an apartment together. His girlfriend is a stay-at-home mom, doesn't work. Kids are three and five years old. He's their only source of income. Okay, this is the guy that's before you. Yeah. He's the offender. As a youngster, he was caught up in gangs. His juvenile record shows he's had several run-ins with the law for dealing drugs and using drugs. He has been in trouble since he's been an adult. The most serious thing he's done is a traffic citation for speeding. But this time, he's before you. He got in a fight. He got in a fight at a ball game. He punched somebody and caused serious injuries. That person comes from a affluential family, family. And they press charges against this individual. They want you to throw the book at him. He broke their son's jaw. He's drinking through a straw. Right? You get the picture here. Now you're the judge. Are you going to consider any type of sanctions rather than sending this person to prison? Or are you just going to send them straight to prison? Uh, just, is there like a reason why he punched him? Depends on who you want to believe. There's witnesses testified. It looked like mutual contact. They were arguing, pushing, shoving. All of a sudden, they're exchanging. Both individuals are seen with their own punches. So one is the other than the other, basically. What do you have? I would go with, like, because we're talking about, like, objective and subjective mm -hmm. justice. Mm -hmm. I would go for, like, a subjective justice. Obviously, these people, people want some sort of justice. Mm -hmm. You said to stick them in a trash can or some sort of, and not literally that, but, you know, some sort of punishment where at least these people feel like, but this person also feels like, oh, I got a good thing. You know, it's a like happy medium where everybody tests what I was That doing. rarely happens, but yeah, good, good yes. idea. What would you do? Keep that train of thought going. It's tough. It's tough. You're the judge, you're elected. And the family that's pressing the charges is actually one of your bigger donors here, can't they? Uh, yeah, it gets tricky. Your heart's probably telling you, give the guy a break. Maybe, you know, a year, house arrest, something. But if you do that, you're going to upset. I was talking about something, some discretionary sentence that he could get kicked off because it sounds pretty bad. So they're like, oh, Let's you're going to get... Let's come up with over here. He's stuck right now. Trying to, are you trying to please everybody? I'm trying to find a way where he can get, he can, what's the word, if he can give back to the family. Maybe restitution. Restitution. Yeah. Because I don't think he deserves jail time at all. It, again, it was a mutual fight. It was just a mutual fight. One hit harder than the other. Mm -hmm. But. Why is he only guy who a mutual fight? I don't know. I kind of don't understand. You don't understand because, a mutual well, because, fight? Because because what we've what? heard is that we've got the job. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, but it's the same minor injuries, but the other the same major injuries. Yeah. yeah, but because one was legitimate and the other didn't, like that's not really fair. But so what is fair? <laughs> well, I don't know. They both got in a fight, so okay, you you didn't submit, so you got your job broken, and that's that. Like I wasn't I <laughs> we did the dog fight the other day um, because there's two pit bulls, and my little nephew opened the door. 
of the garage where the other pit bull was and the pit bull who the house was, but, like they both started, no one was submitting to each other. So they both got hurt. Like they were all bloody and stuff um, until we like got the dogs off of each other. But it's like, who's fault? Like you're walking in to- Well, that is the owner's <laughs> fault. That was easy. But here we got two guys. They had a couple of beers, but neither were drunk. They started yeah. arguing. Little pushing, shoving. Before you knew it, they're throwing fists at each other. One guy sustained significant injury, broken jaw, and the other one took a few. They get black eyes, but nothing serious. But because of the family, they're pushing the district attorney to prosecute. So the DA said, "Okay, yeah, we will." Not before the judge. At one step, the attorney was already impressed. The oh yeah. They said it motion. Yeah. We're just at sentencing right now. I'm just at sentencing. I want to know what we're going to do with this person. Well, I would say, kind of, in the judge situation, and as in the movie, money talks, right? Mm -hmm. And we know this is a wealthy family, the contribution, everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe put him at a lower, lower sentence. That's what you would do as yeah, a judge? Yeah, I mean, just enough to please the family because they have all this funding and everything, very minimal. Okay. Give them that. And then, you know what I'm saying? And then, because this, this is that's all the people want. They want to see him at least go to jail at least for whatever, a year or whatever might be well. Yeah. And, and then, then the mom and the kid on the street. That's the thing. Who's going to yeah. be the yeah. Okay, so the, yeah. the, the, what we discussed then earlier was the part time sentencing where like he okay. sentenced felt like on the weekends when he's not working. Okay, you can do that. And you can do that as a stay at home mom anyways. She's a stay at home mom. So mm -hmm. probably that or something around where like. Some sort of restitution, but it's a low income family. So it gets they, they live day to day. There's no extra Wait, money. But ultimately, it still comes back to the very first chapter about choice. Yeah. That person was drinking. That person knew whatever consequences. He also threw back a sure. punch. But ultimately, it is his fault because he didn't use wisely, you know, his thinking of what put him in that consequence. Okay. No, it's agreed. He did it. It was mutual. There's nothing wrong with that. But now one got some serious injury. You got a rich family, they got influence, they got the DA to pick up the case and prosecute it. Found guilty, now it's up to you as a judge. What type of sentencing are you going to give us? Weekends, after work type of thing, okay. That's one. Is that enough? Do you think the family's gonna be happy with that? Probably one of those things that they just have to be happy with it because, like, he can't overcharge those guys. Sure, he can because of the way he was charged. You're at liberty to sentence this individual to prison for up to five years if you want. As little as one, it's one, three, and five. And I'm making these dates up, so I'm just giving you an example one, three, or five years. It's what this violation carries. So, you could send them straight to prison, throw the books, and for five years. And that's what the family's asking you to do. We play golf together, Judge. You know, I sponsored your campaign. You've been to my house several times. Can't you do me this little favor? Is that corruption? Right? Of course it is. Don't you think that happens? Okay. That's not what we're doing here. No, but I'm giving you an example because I want you to think of all these outside influences the judge is going to have to deal with. It is wrong what this individual is doing, but it does happen every single day. Okay, it does happen. It's up to the judge to say, you know, I appreciate everything, but I'll let you know, I'll let, I rule. I haven't decided yet. Uh, I would do just like supervised release and anger management and okay. maybe like a couple hundred dollars in restitution. Okay. So Judge Drake, you're, you know what you should about that rich family. I mean, supervised release is pretty strict. Uh, I want him to go to prison. I, I I'm know asking you, Judge. You know, I'm not going to back your campaign. And you're up for election it's next year. First offense. I don't care. Is, and every time somebody comes up for a first offense, that's probably what I would do. Supervised okay. release, uh, some sort of diversion to address the problem. You would so probably do the right thing, because that's kind of what the information is telling you to do. In that case, I would 
case like the anger management program would be sufficient for me to address the project of that as I go through the incident. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the restitution is to seek the monetary compensation right. of whatever the family. Yep. And then everybody's whole. Not necessarily. I mean, You're going to lose a friend over this one. Uh, yeah, you really are. That, that's how, you know. But it's up to you. I feel like the money and the reputation. Like, uh, yeah. But I feel like the hundreds of dollars of restitution right there. How much? You said, you said hundreds of dollars, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, like a couple, I mean, Because I feel like money is, is a the problem here dollars. since they are a rich person. Yeah, they're like, it's not the money, but yeah, yeah. you threw that in. That's yeah, good. I mean, I uh, supervise release because there's ORs. Oh, shit, this time. Yeah. Okay, uh, Wednesday, I think we're going to have a visitor.